This recording is the muscular system part two of four. The next group of muscles we're going to look at is the erector spiny muscle group. These are muscles that are the primary extensors of the vertebral column to keep the vertebral column erect or straight. They also help to control flexion, lateral flexion and rotation of the spine and help to maintain the lumbar curve. They act as spinal fixators and are prime movers in trunk extension. If we look at these muscles, we can see that they go all the way from the ilium and the base of the sacrum and even down towards the middle posterior aspect of the sacrum, all the way up to the occiput. Working from medial to lateral, we have spinalis muscles, most medially, then longissimus muscles, and then the iliocostalis muscles. Spinalis, longissimus, Iliocostalis make up the erector spiny muscle group from medial to lateral. If you remember the acronym SLIC, S for spinalis, L for longissimus, and I for iliocostalis that will help you remember this muscle group again from medial to lateral. Levator scapulae originate on the transverse processes of the cervical vertebrae and insert on the superior medial border of the scapulae. Their action is to elevate and adduct the scapulae. The scalene muscles consist of anterior, middle, and posterior muscles. If we look at this picture, it's a little bit easier to see at the top our anterior scalenes, middle scalenes, and posterior scalenes. These muscles originate on the transverse processes of the cervical vertebrae and insert on the first two ribs. Now, their action is to flex the neck when they work bilaterally, when both muscle groups on both sides are contracting, they will flex the neck. If one side is activated, they can laterally flex and rotate the head to the same side. This is one of those muscle groups that if the neck is fixed in position, they can be used as accessory muscles to elevate the first two ribs in deep inhalation. If somebody is really trying to pull air in, you can actually feel those two ribs move upward in deep inhalation. So this is one of those circumstances where origins and insertions can be changed depending upon which body part is fixed. Rectus abdominis is a muscle that goes straight down the abdomen. It originates on the pubic tubercles of the pubic portion of the coxal bones and inserts on the sternum and the cartilage of ribs five through seven. The action of this muscle is flexion of the lumbar portion of the vertebral column. It also can compress the abdomen, depress the ribs, and stabilize the pelvis during walking. 
Rectus abdominis is considered a prime mover in trunk flexion. Do you remember the other name for a prime mover? That's right, it's called an agonist. You'll notice that the rectus abdominis contains tendinous intersections that partition the muscle into sections. That's what makes the appearance of a six pack in certain people when they have a very well-defined rectus abdominis. You'll also notice a very well-defined white line that runs down the center of rectus abdominis. This line, which I'll go over in blue, is the linea alba. It is dense regular connective tissue connecting both sides of the rectus abdominis together. When a woman becomes pregnant, the hormones circulating in her body will change the linea alba, the white line, into a linea nigra, which is a dark colored line, again, due to hormones circulating in her body when she is pregnant. Sometimes that portion of rectus abdominis may tear under extreme stress, and that causes a condition known as diastasis rectus. The word diastasis means separation. Included in the abdominal wall are muscles that run at an angle. The external obliques run from the lower eight ribs to the linea alba and the iliac crest, whereas the internal obliques are deeper. They go from the thoracolumbar fascia and the iliac crest to the linea alba. These do everything the rectus abdominis does in terms of flexion of the trunk, compression of the abdomen, and depression of the ribs. They also do rotation and lateral flexion. Here's lateral flexion. Here's rotation of the vertebral column. The deepest of all of the muscles in the abdominal wall is the transversus abdominis. When you're practicing these terms, exaggerate the names so you'll remember how they're spelled for lab. You can see transversus abdominis on the far right and the expanse that it includes. You can also see how the fibers of this muscle run transversely for the most part across the abdomen. Transversus abdominis compresses the abdomen. This is important during forceful exhalation, <sighs> defecation, urination, and childbirth. One of the things I did not mention in the obliques, which I want to point out to you, is when you are in lab, if you pick up the wall of the thorax, if that's laying there in front of you and you place it against your body, the external obliques will run in a pattern that we call hands in pockets because the fibers of the muscle run in the same direction as you would put your hands in pockets, whereas the internal obliques run in the opposite direction. So internal obliques go this way. Well, it's hard to do with these. External obliques are hands in pockets. If you ran your fingers over the internal obliques in the same direction, you would get a strange sound as it would go across the, the fibers the wrong way. So the fibers go in opposite directions. Here's the external obliques, hands in pockets. Cannot do that with the internal obliques because the fibers run in the opposite direction. Transversus abdominis is best seen on the opposite side of the abdominal wall in the lab. The diaphragm is a muscle that's shaped like a parachute. This muscle attaches to the sternum, ribs six through 12, and the lumbar vertebrae, and has its insertion on a structure known as the central tendon of the diaphragm 
which you can see in this picture on the far left. The diaphragm moves inferiorly during inhalation. As the diaphragm contracts and moves inferiorly, that causes more space inside the thoracic cavity. Therefore, a pressure gradient is created where we have lower pressure inside than the pressure outside, so air flows passively into our lungs down its concentration gradient, which you should remember from the first chapter when we were talking about survival needs. The diaphragm has three openings. One is the caval opening for the inferior vena cava. That's a large vein that's coming from the inferior portion of the body back to the heart. Another is the esophageal hiatus, which is an opening for the esophagus and the nerves for the esophagus and the stomach. And we also have the aortic hiatus, which is an opening for the aorta coming down from the thoracic cavity to the abdominopelvic cavity by way of this opening right here. So the aortic hiatus is an opening not only for the aorta, but for the thoracic duct and the isagus vein. You'll be learning more about the blood vessels and their names in AMP2. The intercostals are muscles that are found in between the ribs. The origin and insertion depend on whether they're internal intercostals or external intercostals. So it really doesn't matter. What I really want you to understand is that the external intercostals elevate and expand the rib cage during inspiration. So think of externals, elevate, put the E's together to remember what they do. Externals elevate, thereby expanding the rib cage during inspiration. The internal intercostals depress the rib cage and pull the ribs together during forced expiration. Inspiration and inhalation are the same thing. Exhalation and expiration are the same thing. <sighs> Usually with major and minor muscles, the major muscles tend to be larger and inferior in position. The pectoralis major and pectoralis minor are the exception to this rule. Pectoralis major is more superficial and it originates on the sternum, the clavicle, and the costal cartilage and inserts on the humerus. The action of pectoralis major is going to be flexion, adduction, and medial rotation of the shoulder. Pectoralis minor originates on ribs two through four or three through five, depending on the source. This picture is actually showing us ribs three through five as the origin and the insertion is the coracoid process of the scapula. The action of pectoralis minor is depression protraction of the scapula. If the scapula is fixed, then potentially pectoralis minor could assist in inhalation as the muscle contracts when the scapula is fixed, that would actually elevate the ribs. Serratus anterior has a very saw-like appearance to the muscle. You can see the little teeth of the saw here. Very similar to the serrated edge of 
a steak knife. It appears like a saw. The origin of serratus anterior is the ribs that inserts on the anterior medial border of the scapula. And the action of this muscle is protraction, protraction of the scapula. It helps to fix the scapula against the rib cage also when the arm is either protracted or raised and then protracted. That's why it's often referred to as the boxer's muscle. I believe that's Mike Tyson in the picture. The trapezius is shaped like a trapezoid. That's how it got its name. It originates on the external occipital protuberance as well as the ligamentum nuchae and the spinous processes of C7 and all thoracic vertebrae and inserts on the acromion process of the scapula, the spine of the scapula, and the lateral third of the clavicle. It actually comes slightly anteriorly. Because of the areas of insertion and the different directions of the fibers of this muscle, there are upper, middle, and lower fibers of trapezius, it has different actions. It can elevate, depress, retract, rotate the shoulders inferiorly, as well as extend the neck. This can also act as a shoulder fixator. Trapezius is sometimes nicknamed the coat hanger muscle. I guess someone saw it and thought it looked like a coat hanger. Next we have rhomboid major and minor. This actually obeys the rule of the minor muscle being superior and smaller than the major muscle, which is inferior and larger. These originate on the spinous processes of C7 through T5 and insert on the medial or vertebral border of the scapula. These adduct the scapulae and rotate them inferiorly. They also help to stabilize the scapula during motion that involves the pectoral girdle. Sometimes these are referred to as the Christmas tree muscle. If you see the rotating skeleton on the right, you'll notice the red looks similar to a Christmas tree. Latissimus dorsi is a very broad muscle. It originates on the spines of the lower six thoracic vertebrae, all of the lumbar vertebrae, the lower three to four ribs, depending on the text that you read, and the iliac crest. It does a lot of this by uh, means of attachment to the dorsolumbar fascia. It inserts on the intertubercular groove of the humerus, which means that we've got a muscle that's coming from behind coming up here and inserting on the intertubercular groove. Because of the insertion location, what this muscle will do is extend, adduct, and medially rotate the shoulders. Extend, adduct, medially rotate the shoulders. This is often referred to as the swimmer's muscle somebody's doing a butterfly stroke and can also depress the scapulae. The latissimus dorsi can help move the elbows back and spread them apart and is the prime mover for extension and adduction. When I remember latissimus dorsi, I remember it as an eme muscle. You can use this or not if it helps. E stands for extension. A stands for adduction, adding together towards the midline. M stands for medial 
rotation, eem. There's another muscle that's going to do this, and I pair them together to help me remember. This is the other muscle. This is teres major. There is a teres minor that does something different entirely. So we're going to look at teres major. It does the same thing. Extension, adduction, and medial rotation of the shoulder. There's eem again. Sometimes Terry's major is referred to as Lat's little helper. You can see the origin is on the inferior posterior and medial border of the scapula, and the insertion is on the medial proximal aspect of the humerus. This takes us to the deltoid muscle, which is shaped like the Greek letter delta. The origin includes the clavicle, the acromion process, and a portion of the spine of the scapula. The insertion is on the deltoid tuberosity of the humerus. You'll notice that there are anterior, middle, and posterior fibers of the deltoid muscle. The action is shoulder abduction. If you ever go to the gym and notice somebody's doing abduction that's slightly anterior and then curls inward at the end of the range, that person's actually trying to focus on the anterior fibers. Straight abduction to the side is focusing on the middle fibers, and if that individual goes slightly posteriorly and then rotates externally with his shoulders, is working the posterior fibers of deltoid. Deltoid is the prime mover in abduction. However, abduction is initiated by a different muscle. The muscle that initiates abduction is called supraspinatus. Speaking of supraspinatus, it is one of four of the rotator cuff muscles. The rotator cuff muscles include supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. If we look at the first four letters of these muscles, we get the acronym SITS, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. Make sure you remember it's teres minor. Supraspinatus is best seen on the posterior aspect of the scapula and is found in the supraspinous fossa inserting on the greater tubercle of the humerus. Infraspinatus is also best seen on the posterior aspect of the scapula. We know this is the posterior aspect because here is the spine of the scapula. Right next to infraspinatus is teres minor. This is a situation where teres minor and teres major do not have the same actions. Terry's major was Lat's little helper. It's an eem muscle. It extends, adducts, and medially rotates the shoulder. However, Terry's minor and infraspinatus go together because they laterally rotate the shoulder. Lastly, we have subscapularis, which is underneath the scapula and is anterior. Therefore, we see subscapularis on the anterior aspect of the scapula, inserting on the lesser tubercle on the humerus. These are the actions of the rotator cuff muscles. Supraspinatus abducts, infraspinatus teres minor, laterally rotate, subscapularis medially rotates. That's your throwing action. Abduction, lateral rotation, medial rotation. Abduction, supraspinatus. Lateral rotation, infraspinatus, teres minor. 
medial rotation subscapularis. Keep practicing that and you'll remember these.